easily bruised, easily pinched, easily distressed. This pain I am feeling, feeling too much, being me, it is not real. In the last few years, a central question has been at the core of my practice. How can I talk about the difficulty to talk? How can I show you through my work that there are certain experiences that are conflicting to deal with, that may not be easy or clear or simple, as, in, as one may think? Because there's something very authoritative about written language. And there's something very authoritative and definitive about a photograph. And here, this will be the medium that I'm choosing to point at their own instability and our instabilities as people. Examine the gaps between language, image, and experience. The limitation of language is explored through its materiality and form. Moments of abstraction become spaces of contemplation, and moments of repetition become spaces of an obsessive search. And my reasoning for this insistent on photography is that photography has a direct relationship with reality, a direct relationship with the concrete. And with it, I try to grasp the tension between abstraction and concreteness of traumatic experiences. Photography collects and freezes moments into a tangible object. And at the same time, the same photograph is a moment that always encapsulates a before and an after. By nature, the photographic frame is a subjective selection. It's always a prop of a bigger picture that we do not have access to that we do not know. And that lack of knowing and that limitation that the media enforces is one I am interested in exploring through my work. This limitation is also a plus, as by getting closer, information that was previously unnoticed is now revealed. The closer you get, the clearer you see, until the switching point where it becomes harder and harder until all that you see is blurry, fuzzy outlines, where focus is beyond reach. To have great pain is to have certainty. To hear that another person has pain is to have doubt. And I think there's something really meaningful about this idea, that it's basically the struggle to share the struggle to pass on an experience that's completely internal, and it may be a really strong experience, but there's almost like a brick wall between experiencing something and then trying to put it into words, to communicate it somehow through a visual. And in my work, there's also an extra level of doubt. The doubt belongs to the person in pain. And yes, there's also a certainty. But sometimes, there is a very strong will to deny. And this type of denial of pain and the struggle to accept it is another thing that I look at or deal with in my work. And in that sense, the idea of a photograph as an index, a document of truth or an evidence that an event has really happened, relates strongly to the idea of trying to give oneself some sort of proof that your pain is real, that something really did happen, even if it may feel so small and everyday-like. And there's another layer, a hand, a shadow. The paper becomes a skin, many times alluding to a touch, to a meeting place, a friction. My work looks into the ripples that are the aftermath of an event. And maybe just a word about the book format as well. As I'm dealing with abstraction, as I'm dealing with messing up a narrative or taking a, talking about a difficult narrative, 
the book format feels like a really good home for this type of question that I have. Questions about how a story is being communicated. Words are traced to paper, embossed on napkins, erased and rubbed with bare hands, glued together and covered with ink and water spills. What does it mean when linearity is not attainable? What does it mean that a story is actually in limbo? Or it goes back and forth? And I think that putting this abstract information in a book alludes to the fact that there is something to figure out, that there is something to learn or to know or to discover. And of course, also, this information is all very interconnected once it's in a book. It creates a syntax between images. They're not separate autonomous objects anymore. They're all part of this bigger sentence, this bigger narrative. If the photograph has an implied duration, the book format has an active one. Information is revealed slowly, and linearity can be played against. allows moments of pure abstraction to be seen in the context of language and become moments of silence or pause, a gap in speech or thought. And this idea of duration is very important in my work, especially as one thinks about and carrying around an experience, carrying around a trauma that may be invisible, may be buried, but it's there. So the book really allows for me to poke and tap into this heaviness and weight of time. A water spill is less visible when dried out. Once it's dry, the paper morphs its body into a new shape. Stains may appear over time. And here, using water, ink, and again, rubbing my hands with it, rubbing the ink, rubbing the water, as a way to conceal some of the information, as a way to discuss this broken narrative, this difficulty, this pain, and the desire to drown it out or make it disappear. And photography, by its nature, tries to show things, tries to make things appear things that perhaps cannot be described otherwise. Um, and here's a great example where Edward Moybridge is able, through a quite complex mechanism, to capture the exact moment of the horse's glide that was portrayed in traditional painting as an open motion of the legs spread it out. But right now, at this moment in time, 1878, we have a really clear defined proof that the fantasy and that the idea does not match reality and that this curled up mid-air position is what actually is. And in my work, I wanted to use that concept, um, the struggle to see, the struggle to understand the internal experience without this outsider perspective without it being reflected back as a visual cue, an image. So I created this false scientific experiment of my own, calling it movement studies as a homage to Moybridge movement studies. And it's actually, there's two very different things here. One is the physical therapy stretches, and the other is maintaining or freezing the pain, grasping one arm of another as a way to try and reduce temporarily the pain that's there. So there's ebbs and flows between quite intense motions and moments of release. And still, I wanted to have space for the text to exist outside of a word document and in the form of an artist book. Photograms are also called contact prints. Usually objects are sandwiched between paper that is coated with light sensitive emulsion and a light source, a projector. Each print is unique. 
with exposure times between 5 and 20 seconds, the darkroom work is its own little performance. Hands flutter in and out of the frame or stay static. The presence of the body is in its shadow, in the form of a light absence. The text is printed first as laser prints, which in turn becomes the contact prints on silver gelatin. The optics of making the print play a big role in its visual. In order to have a traditionally good print, everything is in focus. And to achieve that, you need to use a heavy glass to fully flatten your object. For this work, I wanted a little shift of perception, a shift of focus. The question still haunts me. How can you decide what is real beyond vision, beyond clarity? And the way that I wanted to use my glass meant that some parts are not fully flattened. And therefore, they're out of focus. And this idea of information that is in and out of focus, that's kind of hard to grasp, is one that exists strongly in the book Trauma and Recovery by Judith Herrmann, a book I first encountered in 2020 and still looks at. I wanted to read you this quote that organizes the relationship between language and image as I see it in my own visual art. The conflict between the will to deny events and the will to proclaim them aloud is the central dialectic of psychological trauma. People often tell their stories in a highly emotional, contradictory, and fragmented manner which undermines their credibility and thereby serves the twin imperative of truth-telling and secrecy. Far too often, secrecy prevails, and the story of the traumatic event surfaces not as a verbal narrative, but as a symptom. And through the book, the text itself is wrapped up with its symptoms. It is fragmented, blurry, interlaced, and layered. It disappears and comes back to the surface. I use materials that are meant to give structural support, maintain, and hold as my subject matter. Mold fabric does not hold the spine here, but it acts as a decorative end sheet. Archival tissue paper is teared up, and the utility of each material is in its DNA, yet it does not perform its function. It only shows its soft skin. Lastly, I'd like to share with you the text that I wrote that's also inside of the book. Um, accompanied by the photographs. Easily bruised. Easily pinched. Easily distressed. This pain I am feeling. Feeling too much. Being me. It is not real. It is not worth noting. It is not worth mentioning. It is not worth dealing with. And sometimes the most painful thing is the one we don't consider a thing. It did not take too long. I find myself sitting at lectures, squeezing my forearm, squeezing my elbow. I squeeze, I hold it in place. I squeeze, I forget. I do it once, I do it twice, 
and I stopped making note of doing anything at all. My right palm is glued to my left forearm and elbow. Nervously pushing into my palm and pushing harder. It was then that somebody else pointed to me what I am doing. That somebody else pointed that something looks wrong. A peculiar behavior was taking place to compensate for pain. Then I take note as I continue to squeeze and hold it in place. And how do you decide what is real beyond vision. There's a fork in my road, forks in my mouth, forks in my teeth, forks in my arms. And still, I stay still. I can manage it. So much so that I did not note it is a problem. Maybe a small challenge, as I have led to believe I am the one to add the dramatic flair. And when you speak, you will tire others. Form pushes against matter. Form creates matter. It holds, winks, sighs. lashes out, and spills, and flares. Squint my eyes, open my eyes, the image falls apart. It cannot hold its concise weight. It does not pierce my abdomen. And each thing has its own unique scale. I like it between my palm and the length of an arm. I like to stay close. And it is not what it is. It induces conflict and shame. But it seeks to be. It pushes to push it back in. To be tucked under. Not thinking about it. And outside of vision. Thank you. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, I, I didn't explain it, but I think that what you're saying is totally where I'm headed in my head, that the idea is that it's stretched beyond um, the arm. Like, this is one experience that I'm sharing, but um, the hope is that people have them in to put their own experiences into it, to project it. Um, so yeah, definitely it's the idea of pain in general and how it's being, um, um, how it's being, um, I'm forgetting the word, but basically that it's not attended to many times or it's being ignored or is it like, are we in touch with these things or as a bilingual there's like always this idea of and I've been talking about the book photography as well of mediation and translation like the information is always kind of processed in a lot of different ways mm -hmm. uh, which I find really exciting Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks to Center for Public Arts for this amazing year. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to spend time with you and learn so much about printmaking, but also book arts. Very happy to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Rodrigo Moreira. I am a multidisciplinary artist from Brazil, uh, based here in New York. And my work is about social, uh, in social tensions that emerge in everyday life.
I'm, I'm at Multidisciplinary Artists from Brazil and based here in New York and my work is about social tensions that happen, uh, that emerge in everyday life. I look to social spaces such as the city and the internet uh, to collect personal narratives and place them in a larger context. Uh, I work on appropriation of mass communication elements such as graphic design, photographs, public archives, magazines, and I create works in printmaking, video, and text. Uh, I'll be talking about the two works that I have on the show right now, but because they are part of a larger body of work, I will also mention and highlight some of the pieces that are in the series that I call NSA, No Strings Attached, which deals with my uh, experience as an immigrant living in the, in the US. Uh, so, the idea behind this work uh, began even before I moved to the US. I was living in Brazil and I wanted to visit New York for four, five days, I guess, at the time. And I had to apply for a, a tourist visa at the, that time. And I was really shocked and impressed, impressed by the amount of information I had to share with the American government just in order to get a visa to stay here for a couple of days. And at that point, I started thinking about also that person who was uh, collecting and having access to a lot of information that I was providing, almost to the point that they could make sense of who I was, just looking at my data, just looking for my uh, records. And of course, this person uh, is embodying an institution, is embodying a culture, a country. It felt a bit like the US was getting to know me better, and somehow I knew so much about this country already. It felt like I was starting a new relationship, mm -hmm. a one-sided relationship due to the lack of transparency because uh, at that time I was the one uh, requested to provide a lot of information and I didn't get anything back, but hopefully I would get a visa, which actually I did. So I started looking at immigration as a romantic relationship, as a metaphor for a romantic relationship, because in both situations, uh, you have to deal with boundaries, uh, limits, desire, and control. But what kind of relationship is that? Uh, I was really interested and uh, curious to understand what type of relationships do immigrants establish with a different country and culture, but also on the other, on the, uh, vice versa, what type of commitment does the country have with immigrants. So I think uh, that uh, NSA type of relationship would be a good way to describe this dynamic. And it also suits the whole idea behind the project because on a political level, NSA could mean national security agency, but also on a more personal level could uh, mean uh, non-strings attached, which I think is a good way to describe the situation. And bringing both aspects together related to immigration, both personal and political, this project fits about uh, expectations, desires, surveillance, control, and power dynamics. Uh, this is my first attempt to uh, represent this, this idea, combining uh, elements and objects in the same situation that could play both part in a romantic or a dominant scenario. Uh, the image on the right is a distorted version of the original photograph, bringing up uh, a different perception and interpretation about this uh, relationship. Uh, so during my process of, uh, my research process of uh, data collecting and state surveillance, I came across 
an interview with Gus Hunt. He was at the time the CIA uh, CTO, uh, Chief Technology Officer. And I love how he, uh, how he, what he said could be read in so many levels and so many different uh, ways. It basically says that the value of any piece of information is only know when you can connect it with something else that arrives at a future point in time. Since you don't connect dots you don't have, it drives us to a mode of we fundamentally try to collect everything and hang onto it forever. Uh, it was really interesting an idea for me. Of course, he was talking about his work and about the, the role of state surveillance and technology. It was around 2013 when we had a lot of media coverage on the WikiLeaks and Julian Assange and then after uh, a little while, I think uh, Edward Snowden came uh, forward uh, exposing the NSA and social media and technology. But it, it was really interesting uh, to me this idea of collecting dots that will make sense uh, of something in a future point in time. And I started thinking about how this could also be related to art making, the life, and also immigration itself. So his declaration got me thinking again and one more time about personal information, interpretation, surveillance, and how data is uh, assessed, but also its implications. So in response to that, I decided to create this fictional government called uh, the, the Department of NSA No Strings Attached, which is uh, an office that could be responsible for collecting data on queer immigrants living in the US. This is my uh, first attempt to address that, and I created this oversized immigration survey based on the real US Customs and Border Protection form uh, that you have to fill in when you're, whenever you're crossing uh, the bound, the, crossing the border and coming into the country. It was a piece of paper at the time. I think now it's all, it's all digital, but anyway. And in this version, uh, I'm trying to combine uh, both security questions that you could have in that form, but also in other forms related to different stages of immigration, like the applying for a green card, applying for a job, applying for uh, citizenship, and also combine two more personal questions uh, that you could find on dating apps when you have to set up a profile when you want to you know, uh, meet someone else. So these questions become uh, more and more invasive and subjective. Um, yeah. So the, the, my, my experience at the border, again, also informs this next work. Uh, the video is, uh, shows about 10 different situations that go back and forth in the way that the video is added and reveals a little bit of the department's activities. Uh, it focuses on hand gestures that's supposed to uh, represent interactions between immigrants and immigration officers, officers at the border. And the motivation that behind this work is really my own experience in going through passport control and realizing this almost designed situations to make you feel uncomfortable, under pressure, and tense. So I wanted to take that to a more extreme level and add a surreal touch to it and just to expose how silly these interactions could be and, uh, and create these uh, absurd performances as well. So, uh, since I got here in the US, uh, my experience, I would say that uh, the immigration experience could be very isolating at times. It was really hard to explain uh, to people. I, I came here, I didn't have any connections, I didn't know any other immigrants. So it was really hard for me to find people who I could really uh, share what was happening in my daily life. Of course we go and look at the media and there's always these reports about you know the immigration crisis at the border and the refugee crisis and these are very important topics we have to talk about them of course but i didn't see a lot of you know what is daily life immigration once once you're here once you're dealing with once you're sharing uh having a schedule or something like that there are a lot of other things that you have to consider that it was really hard to explain to someone who was not in that situation so feeling the need to uh, make sense of my own experience, I started contacting all the immigrants online and requested them uh, an interview about their experiences and their relationship with the US and American culture. Uh, 
uh, this time actually I was reversing the, the role and taking the role of the immigration officer going through uh, the profiles on Instagram, researching hashtags, just trying to find people who could fit uh, this idea I had for the project, but also investigating a little bit about their social media, their uh, online presence, and how they por portray themselves uh, on the internet. Um, so, uh, <coughs> Once I would talk to them, uh, I, I, actually, once I would contact them, contact them, and start to create this conversation and this narrative that I was uh, talking to people about, they became the source material that I used to create works in the series. Uh, here, after the, each interview, I would transcript the audio and re the, the audio recording and create a report filed under the, the Department of NSA No Strings Attached, which represent a redacted version of that conversation. Uh, this office memorandum is presented uh, as six screen printed, and they mark a little bit of the official government uh, documents that were released at some point. And so here are uh, some examples of the, the reports. Uh, and I close up with one of them with the text. And the memos, they are combined, uh, the combined text and uh, images that represents the idea of America and immigration itself. And they come sometimes from, you know, historical archives, but also more contemporary images, really highlighting this uh, icons and symbols that we as immigrants have from this idea of life in America, what is to be American, and what is to be uh, in the US. So uh, the artist's book that's also in the show is directly linked to this previous work, uh, Office Memorandum Extracts Volume 1, takes a passport format and presents 14 stories. Uh, here are some page samples, but basically, uh, the reports uh, are also combined with images taken from the original memos, but differently from the memos uh, for the book, I'm really focused on a specific topic for each individual, each uh, conversation I had. And this topic is something that's, uh, that stand out to me during our conversations that could be related to language barriers, bureaucracy, uh, cultural shocks, sexuality, identity, freedom, this idea of freedom, or expectations for the future, and so on. Uh, yeah, I'm actually working now on volume two uh, of the, the, the memos as well, and my goal is to bring at some point in the future all the stories together in a single book, but we shall see. Thank you, that's all. The, the next volume and the idea for the for the entire project as one book. Do you imagine the series as, as in the format of passports or like in a different format? Yeah, I think I would have another passport book that would be like volume two uh, with more stories, different stories. But yeah, my idea is to create this volume of books, but probably at some point I think it would make sense just to bring everything together in a different format, but still having the the stories that I've been collecting so far. Actually, it's really related to the TSA uniform. I think it's the first <laughs> thing you see when you're trying to come to the country. And they are, I mean, I, blue is also my favorite color, but still, like, <laughs> it strikes me that, you know, that person holds so much power and is also uh, 
wearing this beautiful uniform. <laughs> you know, it's almost like this conflict of, you know, uh, you could be a nice person, but you could be also a bad person, and it's it's just like something that. Uh, during the, my research process as well, it's a color that repeats in institutional documents and you know the, the ori original form, but also the blue that's very always related to America, the, the flag and uh, you know this idea of freedom and the sky is blue. So I think it, it's a nice color to to you know represent the whole uh, project as well. Other question: You said you were asked questions when you first came. Yeah. What they ask you? Like, well, it's, it's basically like you know uh, when you, when you I was living in Brazil, you had to apply to a visa and also have this conversation prior to your trip. So they will ask you about the places you've been before, or you know sometimes uh, questions about your family and where they are and how long do you want to stay here. You know, the basically security questions, and also you have to take biometrics as well. Uh, before coming to, before even you know, trying to to see if you get a visa. Or not. So yeah, there's also that documentation. Sorry, if I missed this in your bio, in your bio but did you do book arts before the before the residency? I was curious to know like what stood out as different compared to your work with video and rest. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I have a background in graphic design, so I am in the book field somehow, but it was really nice to spend time here because it really opened my mind to what a conception of an art book could be. It's not really only, you know, a book that I was designing for 15 years before I became an, a, a resident here, but it, it's also very, it was very interesting to me to just, you know, expand that vision and try to see how uh, content and form can also bring together uh, and contribute to what you want to say conceptually for a project as well. I wanted to, uh, you to ask uh, if, if you can, uh, in a nutshell, talk a little more about your process of the book itself. I mean, the, <coughs> the building process, the design process, materials, and just a little more details of the... Right. The, the yeah, I mean, I had this idea of, of yeah. just compiling some of the stories that I had before in the reports, but I wanted to bring to a book format, and I didn't have actually like a lot of time to think about things, and because the whole project is also referencing uh, official documents, I think the passport is basically the symbol of, you know, the ultimate goal when you are an immigrant. You want to have that uh, American passport to make sure that, okay, this, this is where I am now, I'm here, nobody can, you know, uh, deport me or, or whatever. So I think it was a, a great uh, format to reference for, for this, final, uh, this final work. And yeah, so it basically mimics the same amount of pages, but I also wanted to combine uh, the stories and the images in somehow. And uh, talking a little bit about the materials, it was printed here by Calypso uh, in Rizzo Print, and uh, I had the help with uh, 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 Sarah Smith uh, from Stockpile, and she did the binding for me as well, and the outstanding for
Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I think uh, the whole project from the very beginning, I wanted, I, I knew I wanted to create like this brand that's very, you know, uh, a graphic design state of mind that, you know, you need a logo, you need color palette, you need this and that, but it was very easy for me to start that and also mimic something that already existed. So looking at official documents and the way government positions themselves in a more branding way as well, it all came to place when I was trying to create my own department and my own um, office. But yeah, that's that, that was a conscious decision about uh, mimicking that, but also adding things that I knew already from uh, my back, uh, my graphic design background as well. And of course, it helps a lot when you have to design a book, if you know, <laughs> a set of skills. I guess, sorry, if that's okay, but... Sure, it is. redaction was, I mean, what was your criterion for what you re redacted? Yeah, so uh, it's an interesting question because actually I'm redacting things that I think we talk about but they're not very interesting, you know, it's almost like redacting to expose what I think you should be looking at, but also sometimes I would also redact things that are more sensitive when they would mention uh, someone else or a name or a specific place or city that they could be identified somehow. Mm -hmm. So there's also this uh, tension between what you can see or what you can't. But my idea is really like get rid of the boring stuff that, you know, I'm not really, I don't think it would add to the conversation in this particular time, uh, case. <clears throat> All right, thank you everyone. <laughs>
uh, that arrived to the to the shore in in the 24 hours that um, make a make a made a made a day or yeah the, the, how do you say that in which a, a day make a full day yes and I spent three days uh, in the in the beach uh, counting counting the counting the waves. Um, so and the the result of, of those counties were um, in the north were a group of um, drawings. Uh, for each hour that I spent uh, was uh, that I spent uh, counting the waves was one drawing, and for each um, for each wave also uh, was one line. You know? so our twenty four drawings and. Uh, each one is a compound of the number of uh, waves in translated in horizontal lines in in these um, in these yeah in, in these rounds. Um, and the handful of sand also the counting of, of the grains of sands uh, become translated in a in a big um, in this big just is not um, the, the picture doesn't show it too well, but this is a, a really big uh, paper uh, that is full of little dots. So for each each grain of sand is one dot, where like one thousand two dots, I think. Um, and then when I went to the to the forest to the Amazon, I well I fell totally in love of the on the Amazon and the knowledge of the people that live there. I was uh, with a Ticuna community. I uh, met a, a timber <coughs> worker that was I, I spent four days with him in the jungle and it was just amazing to 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 know him. Like each each three steps that we uh, we walk in the jungle, he cut a piece of with a machete, a piece of the bark of a tree and and show it to me, it's like, hey, this is cinnamon, Amazon cinnamon, smell it, you know? And, and then go to another, cut a little piece, and hey, this is um, a bark with the woman's stop the bleeding uh, when, they, when the kids, when they have kids, uh, they stop the bleeding with this bark, you know? And like this amazing, like, knowledge of the, of their, of the environment, and I was thinking like, wow, I mean, how, separate of essential things we are in the cities no and um, and after that it, that work I I became obsessed with um, with science natural science but also with the idea of the forest no um, um, I'm really interested in environmental issues. And uh, I, when I arrived here in the, uh, to, the, um, to the residency, I was, uh, while I was doing the residency, I read uh, these three books that I'm going to pass them. Uh, one is against the Anthropocene, the other is the Capitalocene. The Capitalocene uh, uh, is a companion of uh, like the stories um, that, that uh, for this author, uh, the climate crisis exists is for this, like, or he traces it through these specific uh, situations. And uh, at the end of the residency, I was reading the biography of Humboldt. Um, so, so doing, uh, thinking in that, thinking in, in this uh, interest uh, that I have about um, environment, uh, environmental issues, I did a group of, um, drawings uh, thinking that I, I was thinking to do a, a, fan, a fan scene later um, and I realized like here in the city uh, is really uh, there's a big uh, problem with uh, skyscrapers and birds you know like New York is in a migratory path a really important migratory path for 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 birds and it's like um, the, the population of migratory birds since uh, the 70s has decreased at, in a 28% in the world. So the situation is really, really concerning, and the solutions are really, really easy. But because it has to do with money, uh, people don't, 
it's not changing nothing, no? Uh, and uh, new, the problem with New York is like the skyscrapers are made with this reflective, uh, not friendly glass uh, that um, the bird are, is invisible for birds. So literally thousands of birds die every year, like a crash with the with the buildings in Manhattan. So. Uh, Part of the residency, because I'm not a book artist, I'm, I'm my, all my work is really uh, research-based, I was thinking in how I can uh, bring this concern to a book, you know? So I was uh, working on this, beside the exhibition, I was working on this, um, I'm going to pass it to this too. Um, uh, how to, because it's also something that I noticed is like in the city, uh, the problem with the birds is not, is not well known. I mean, people that live here don't know too much about the situation, and it's a situation that um, thinking about us, because always we think about us as humans, uh, this is something that is going to affect us really bad if migratory birds get to extinct. I mean, it's like agriculture is going to collapse. Um, yeah, I mean, basically agriculture is going to collapse and the prices of everything is already really expensive now. Imagine uh, if, we did, if we don't have crops to feed uh, people. Um, so, so yes, I was, I was doing that. It's a project that is, is ongoing. I, um, have not solved some things, but uh, thanks to the residency, I, I start to think about it, like how to uh, put that in a kind of book. <laughs> and, um, well, okay. Sorry, it's just I'm, I'm a little nervous and, and my head is going a little fast uh, all the time. <laughs> So um, I was wanting also to, oh, okay, I was talking about this obsession that I have with natural science. And when I arrived here in the United States, um, I started to write this little essay that is called Astronauts in the Jungles, and I also wanted to pass it. <laughs> um, that is an essay that I'm trying to draw um, kind of, um, points of intersections between things that I feel after go to the forest that are totally connected, um, but maybe are not so uh, easy to find those connections in a really fast uh, look to it. And was like how uh, science uh, are actually like a developed uh, way to think of this first or a um, first uh, Scientific science, scientists that were uh, I don't know indigenous communities the 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 scientific method that start like observing and taking notes is something that uh, people or humans has been uh, have have been done it like for millennia you no know? and uh, but we forget many times that like this knowledge is uh, is is encapsulated or. Or, or ha are, has come in uh, not from the modern science, but from the ancestral knowledge. So what I do, what I do in that essay is compare the shamans with the the shamans with the astronauts, and and how are really uh, related uh, both of them in a certain uh, speculative way. Um, so doing, uh, like thinking about all these topics when I arrived to here, to New York, uh, when I arrived to the uh, residency, I, um, I was just finished to, to write this essay. And, um, and uh, a thing that I do also is like collect things. I collect things and count things compulsively. And I was counting a, or collecting names of endangered species um, in that moment. And uh, I was really interested while I was doing the residency to, yeah, how to 
concretize like all these uh, little obsessions that I have, how to make it something um, beside the, the, the thing with the birds. And, um, uh, and I found like all this year, I was having all these names since I arrived here. To, I, I started to look the names of, well, I collect American endangered species, names of American endangered species, names of uh, American critical endangered species, and names of American extinct species. So uh, when I start to read my list of names, I and I start uh, to check the names in internet, uh, many of them I was not finding like the, the picture of the species that are, the species that are extinct, and that called uh, my attention a lot in certain way. I start to think then that these names are like the only remain of these uh, beings that are not there anymore. So, uh, I, I start to think how to collect the names and reread them it are the art are it was the only way that bring these uh, beings to life again you know? like so the names or the, the yeah the, the the reading of the name become a kind of a spell like a, like a, to resuscitate a kind of ghost you know. Uh, so at the end uh, for the for the for the exhibition, what I did was put this list of names um, that looks a little bit uh, like the memorial, uh, like memorials when uh, people die and uh, are all these in, tra in like tragedies. Yes, yeah, so all these kind of uh, list of names. I was wanting to do something like that, but I was wanting also to use like this really fragile. Uh, newspaper that we use here like all the time I feel like um, what the, the the materiality of the newspaper uh, uh, was also talking about like this fragility and and this kind of uh, I don't know if the word in English is banishment or vanishing like la desaparición you know it's like this Things that are not are not going to endure anymore, you know. Um, so I like I like the idea that uh, the list of the names is a thing that takes me a lot of work. Then it's like I need to see for days to make uh, the 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 drawings, but at the same time, are drawings that are going to perish, you know, are because it's newspaper, so it's not going to endure too much. So. Each time that I want to show it, I need to redo it again. And also, like the list is going to is changing because the endangered species are uh, the ones that are drawn with graphite. The critical endangered species are the ones that are uh, like half graphite, but also only through intaglio or pressing them. And the extinct are the ones that are don't have any kind of pigment. Um, and I don't need some pictures, but you can see them there, but I'm going to show some pictures of them. Uh, while I was doing the residency, I was trying also, because happened me what Rodrigo was telling, I, I arrived really recently uh, from Colombia to here. Uh, you can notice like my English still is not perfect. Um, and. Uh, and I was wanting also to to find like um, some connection with these um, like of m my interest with uh, with another uh, people. So I thought in meetings uh, that I actually only did one. And Ronnie, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to that um, meeting. It was called um, the conspiracy of the pessimistic trees. Uh, the idea was like because I read a lot, I was wanting to make a kind of reading group about these topics and maybe at the end uh, use the machines to do some posters about it. 
and uh, to be sat together, you know. But um, but yeah, I only happened once, and and Ronnie was the person that uh, super sweet. Thank you so much, all super sweet, for 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 coming that that day. I want to show just. Okay, so these, um, mm -hmm. these were some uh, like experimentation to drawing that I was doing in that moment, um, precisely because I was feeling like the residency was allowing me to experiment with things that I, I'm not uh, used to, to do, I started drawing a lot. Um, these are other things that I started to do while I was in the residency. Um, there were some drawings in which I started to uh, to read um, to read uh, which are the and, and to look to search which are the uh, brands that are uh, connected with some environmental uh, problems in in the world and what uh, in which way these brands are helping that the world become i mean the, the world become like a more ugly place no <laughs> um, and uh, so these ones are like industrial fishing is really devastating uh oceans uh these are ones of that that i found like are directly connected with industrial fishing so i was doing like this kind of um like um how do you say, like notes, like in order to have these on your table, uh, companies such these ones, uh, are fishing and fish, farming, uh, are fish farming and industrial, are fishing and fish farming and industrial levels, polluting oceans, decimating species and destroying ecosystems. So was like how, how, was more or less to think like how the ocean is, is now, uh, lacking of fishes, you know, uh, I, and actually it's happening, I don't know, I, I read a study, I don't know the, the year exactly in this moment, but there is a study that says that it's going to be more plastic in, I don't know, in three, in three years more plastic in the oceans than fish in the oceans, um, and this one is the other about uh, the Amazon, um, the Amazon is, is, has been really impacted uh, in this moment, I mean it's like in the last in the last decade, uh, a huge quantities of the forest has been like totally erased to uh, cultivate soybean, and not soybean for food, but soybean for uh, biodiesel. Um, and these are the companies also that are helping to that. Uh, so that is another thing that I did in the residency. Um, this little book that well the uh, fancying that i was uh that is there like passing uh become for one of the projects of um of the cba a poster uh so yeah that is the poster this is another uh fancying that i uh, I'm, I'm i was doing i'm doing um and it's about the endangered species but in the amazon uh, and i start to draw tra drawing them um well this is a this is a video of the falling ones how was the process to do it but you have you have it around there <laughs> Not And these are some things, uh, um, well, the conspiracy of the pessimistic three be trees becoming the conspiracy of the pessimistic three. Um, and these are some things that I, I, I did, uh, that I learned also. Uh, Ronnie uh, is an amazing teacher, and I, I learned a lot uh, from her. Um, I did some posters 
with the old uh, with that. And these are some images of the work that is in the is in the in the room. Uh, this little piece that is uh, uh, a sculpture is just a commentary um, that is connected with those drawings that I showed before about the about the brands. Um, uh, I was reading a, a, an article, was not a book, was an article that uh, was uh, criticizing the way that uh, we think about land and earth, how earth become in this moment, just an object that uh, we can't, in, from we we can't extract things, no, and and no, and we forget that actually it's a it's an organism, it's an organ, it's a multi-organism that is uh, that is supporting our lives here. And um, a critic that the article was doing concretely uh, was about the pot, pot soil pot and how. This idea of the soil, pot, potting soil, uh, is uh, is like the expression of what is wrong with uh, with our way to think about the world. Mm -hmm. How uh, when we buy potting soil, uh, we are uh, we are buying uh, an object and and a dead actually is a kind of corpse of. Uh, of, of the organism, how uh, it's totally uh, the is a is is a we need to in order to kill we need to this eliminate uh, the idea of a being in in the other and 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 the article explained a little bit how uh, when agriculture uh, uh, start. Uh, also, start the the um, how do you say like the process of the the the, the, the structure of um, environment in a certain way. Um, so I I put all these two figures that are uh, marble marbly mar how do you say marble are marble and uh, my intention with with them was like um, um, they they are anthropomorphic figures, but at the same time, they uh, the marbling uh, looks a little meaty, like fleshy, uh, to to bring uh, the. I mean, it was a kind of idea to represent uh, a human figures through 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 them. Um, yeah, so that it is. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. 
for the fallen ones, are all those birds, all those species, are the species that are impacted by the yes. visible glass? Yes, yes. All the species that you saw in the front scene are the species, are migratory birds that come to New York because are species that you can find them here in the migratory season and that are being impacted uh, for them. If somebody wants to know about this, uh, the uh, Audubon Society has a lot of information. Um, yeah. yeah. Are these ones that you found? What did did you, you find that the drawings that you did were of birds that you found or this is, they were drawings of from photographs and somebody else I think I'm just wondering if you uh, collected the our, birds. Our, our drawings, uh, that, I mean, I did the drawing looking pictures of okay. those kind of, of those species, of, uh, those yeah. bird species, yes. They're, I, yeah. so there's birds that are very, very close to you. I've seen fall out yeah. of from the windows, hitting the windows. It's, it's, it's devastating. Yeah, I totally, yeah. I, I have seen some of them, but dead in the streets yeah yes. yeah and they clean up really quick so nobody will uh, yeah. be disturbed yeah i the thing is like i heard um that the how do you call to the people that clean the buildings in the early mornings they come and pick them up yeah. um and uh, no it's like no many people know about this it's like the people that has experienced the situations is because people walk before a.m and actually, NYC Audubon Society, uh, they make wax to count the deaths of the people and the impact in each season uh, be between 6 and 8 a.m. Because after that, it's like they are just yeah. pick it up. Yeah. yeah. Pick, it's, pick, pick them. it's really hard. Yeah. Yeah, it's like they, one, yeah. one billion of birds die every year, every medium in the world. And only here in, in, in New York, it's like 250,000 or something like that every season. I mean, it's just horrible. Yeah. I'm sorry for finish like in that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>